Yes, happy Wednesday and welcome everyone indeed. And we're so grateful for you to be in this space. So thank you for your gratitude for being allowed into the space. We're happy to have you here. Uh, my name is Brianna Jackson. I am the uh, Learning and Development Program Manager for Washington County. So my role is focused on setting the strategic vision um, for learning across the county. And my goal is really to create a culture of continuous learning and in the same spirit of a culture of continuous learning that allows us to be able to um, learn the things that are important to us for different reasons, things like this happen in that space. And so we're really excited to be able to have this opportunity today. Um, the reason why we are having uh, this particular um, workshop is that um, uh, of what remains of this year and then well into 2022, the Portland and Salem metro areas will resettle several communities uh, forced from their homeland right after the U.S.-led military withdrawal from Afghanistan. So at present, around 5,000 new Oregonians are projected to arrive under the Department of State Special Immigrant Visa Program. Many more families in urgent need of resettlement assistance will allow will follow excuse me under a variety of other immigration programs as one washington county we want all of our staff to be prepared to welcome our new neighbors into our services wherever we may encounter them and so that's really the purpose of why it is that we're here and so what you can expect today and in the following sessions is that this will be a one hour format so um within our one hour we'll have about 45 minutes of content and then 15 minutes of uh, Q&A. And I will be moderating our Q&A towards the end of our program. And so we just want to encourage you to, to listen hard and to prepare some really great questions that you can drop into chat. Um, and then we will get into those questions at the end of our session. Since we have such a limited time, we just want to be mindful that we have our guests to be able to present their content. And then we will flow into um, our questions. And we recognize that no culture can be explained in a matter of hours or days. Um, but that does not stop our desire to want to be able to do something to be able to help support our new Afghan families that will be coming into our area. We recognize that culture, um, cultural learning is a lifelong practice, and these are introductory trainings that will hopefully give us um, some starting information and motivation to do more learning and relationship building. Again, these sessions are being recorded, so if you have a colleague who's unable to attend or you have a desire to go back and um, listen again, you will have that opportunity in the, the near future. At this time, I want to, before I turn it over to Latricia, I want to just kind of give us some ground rules as it relates to how it is that we want to be um, operating in this space today. So I'm going to try... Um, to share my screen over the other screen that's being shared right now um, so that we might be able to see our ground rules just for a moment. So today, as we look into our conversation, just want to make, oops, excuse me, make sure that you can see this well is that this is a learning space. And so our desire is for us to be uh, curious and to ask questions and to afford grace to others and to refer, um, excuse me, reserve judgment. We also want to avoid personalizing feedback. We're going to hear some things about um, other cultures, about how they engage with our culture, and it's not to be um, you know, personalized um, at all. Um, we know that this is a brave space. It's an opportunity for us to um, you know, take courage as we step into um, this equity diversity and inclusion space um, and to really honor confidentiality. What leaves here are the lessons but not the individual stories so that if you happen to have your colleague or hear them say something or question something that we take the lesson but not oh well Brianna said um, because that's not fair to this safe space. Um, we want you to also be mindful and listen with an open mind. Um, when we're listening to what people are sharing with an open mind we have an intent to understand and we also have the opportunity to ask clarifying questions. And again, that's happening towards the end of our session. We also want to make sure that we're making space for everyone. So please be sure to lean in when you have questions, but also lean out to allow other people to ask their questions as well. And last, we would want you to remember to accept a lack of closure. Some conversations and work will take additional time and care. So please remember that systems were not built overnight. And so dismantling them will not happen overnight either. So 
everything will not be fixed or addressed in one session. And so we encourage you to continue coming back and doing additional work to be able to learn um, how we can support the work here. So uh, with that, I want to go ahead and turn over um, my talking time to Latricia Tillman, who is our Chief Equity Officer. Latricia, thank you so much for hosting us in this space today. Thank you so much, Brianna, for uh, welcoming us into the space and for um, setting the container, the space, uh, the ground rules that we'll be using today for our conversation. I was really excited to hear from uh, people that I consider to be wonderful partners uh, in this work of advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, uh, both Wajdi Saeed and I'm Jawad Khan from the Muslim Educational Trust and the work that they're leading to resettle Afghan refugees within our Washington County community. Um, and so just briefly, I don't think I did this before I jump into introducing Jawad, just want to take a moment to introduce myself. It's nice to see all the folks participating on this call. It's an amazing um, turnout. Uh, we have over 75 people on the call, which is wonderful. So welcome to you all. I'm Latricia Tillman. I'm the Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer for Washington County. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm very excited you're all here. Uh, briefly, let me introduce our speaker today, Jawad Khan. He is currently the Chief Programming Officer at the Muslim Educational Trust and is a member of the MET Board of Directors. Uh, he was born in Houston, Texas to Indian immigrant parents and has spent 21 years with MET as a teacher, guidance counselor, and administrator. Um, his skills in delivering workshops uh, and combating Islamophobia to um, multiple jurisdictions, uh, schools, government, nonprofits throughout the metro area. And before joining MET, Jawad worked in the high tech industry before starting his own startups. Uh, he has a degree in business administration and economics from Portland State University. And we are very happy that he is also a Washington County resident. So without further ado, I want to welcome Jawad Khan uh, into this conversation and turn it over to him. Thank you so much, Latricia, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I would like to echo uh, uh, what we consider here at the Muslim Educational Trust, Sister Latricia, and we have welcomed Washington County and uh, Sister Latricia into our community here because we understand uh, that the work of creating spaces that are equitable for everybody requires many different hands and many different people and we can't be more thankful to have Latricia in the position that she's in to further promote uh, equity. So thank you so much, Latricia. My name is Jawad Khan, and I will be presenting a brief overview about Afghan history and culture. And uh, as Brianna mentioned at the very beginning, it is impossible to present about a culture, a long-lasting culture going back thousands and thousands of years in one workshop and in and one 45 minute one hour snippet but what we can do is begin to understand a little bit about the people um, that will be coming to washington county and some who have already come here and the families as latricia alluded to uh, that the muslim educational trust is working with so this will be a three-part series the first part today about a little bit about afghan history and culture and then we have two more trainings that will get more into the specific programming and the needs of this community. So please, if you have questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them at the end. And uh, this, uh, I personally have been someone who I was working with for the past 20 years. The Afghan families here have learned a little bit um, about the culture and some of the needs, a lot more about those things that we've seen in the resettling. So, that is our uh, beginning here. So Afghanistan is a landlocked country bordered by Pakistan to the east and south 
Iran to the west, and Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan to the north, and Tajikistan and China to the northeast. Uh, Afghanistan is predominantly mountainous with plains in the north and the southwest that are separated by the Hindu Kush mountains. Its population as of 2020 was about 31 million, and then Ka and Kabul serves as its capital and largest city. It has wide geographic diversity, and you can see some of the uh, the geographic physical diversity here in some of these pictures of the Khyber, the famous Khyber Pass, the Hindu Kush Mountains to the north and the southwest, uh, the Bukhlan province, the plains that grow much of the produce and uh, agricultural products that we'll talk about in just a second, and then Kabul, the capital city. One of the things that you notice right away about Afghanistan and its borders is that it has in the middle in confluence of so many different cultures in the past. And because of this central location, it has been also the target of many invasions throughout history. So you have within um, the zeitgeist of the Afghan mindset about invasion, about turmoil, and about resilience. And a little bit later on, we'll talk about some of the core values that we see uh, in Afghan culture, regardless of the many different ethnicities that reside there, which we'll talk about as well. One of the things about understanding in my, my own personal journey to understanding different cultures is that, as alluded to by both Brianna and Latricia at the beginning of the presentation, is that there is no monolith um, about anybody. Oftentimes when I give presentations about Islamophobia or about Islam in Iran, about Muslim culture, uh, one of the things that we really hope that people understand and, and take away with them is that you cannot have 1.8 billion people and distill them down to a monolithic where they believe in this. Because we know that that's not true for anybody. That's not even true within our own families. Uh, you know, we can have... I'm sure we remember back to a road trip that we had, and we can swear that this happened, and then my brother and my sister will say, no, 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 it didn't happen that way. And so when we talk about cultures, we want to give as broad a definition and introduction here as possible, and then many people will have maybe slightly different interpretations about things, but we want to try to give a broad base here. So Afghanistan was at the confluence of these diverse cultures, especially as it was part of the Silk Road. And then we know the Silk Road because people came and brought them many different goods, both from the West and the East, that when they stopped and wanted to trade, little hubs of civilizations began to grow around these centers of trade. And so you had people who brought their languages, they brought their faiths, they brought their customs, they brought their traditions, and from that, small cities would grow. And in this, you would have this cosmopolitan confluence of cultures and ideas, and from there you would have things grow. And so Afghanistan has always been in the middle of this, but it has a very long, rich tradition. And I didn't put the bullet point here because we could talk about this for hours itself, but you have all the way back into uh, prehistory, going back 50,000 years that we found artifacts in uh, Afghanistan. Well, we can say that civilization about 3,000 before the Common Era, and we know that we've seen um, architecture in Mundagak, which is near Kandahar, and has been at the center of the Helmand culture, and we also believe that this could be an outpost of the Indus River Valley civilization, one of the earliest civilizations that we know, including with the River Valley civilizations in China. The Persians under Darius the Great conquered, uh, parts of Afghanistan, what's known now as Afghanistan, was not known as Afghanistan back then, which we'll get to in just a, just a second. And the Greeks, led by Alexander the Great, also made incursions into Afghanistan. A little bit of trivia, or something that's interesting that people might not know, is that the city of Kandahar that has become popular and into the, uh, the, the cultural uh, mindset, because we've heard so much about the, the recent turmoil, and of course the turmoil for the past 30 years or 40 years or 50 years that have been happening. But Kandahar was originally going to be named by Alexander the Great after
after him. Alexander had a pension for naming cities after him, which uh, I suppose if you're Alexander the Great, uh, you have that, that purview to do so, like Alexander in Egypt. But Kandahar was supposed to be Alexander, and then the word for Alexander, Iskander, is how we get the name of Kandahar. You also had a Buddhist civilization that flourished from the late first century and its kings uh, in the reigning of Banyan until the end of the 10th century, and then trade to Herat and Kandahar from about 642 to 700 brought Islam. And then Islam there, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on, gained power uh, when the civilizations in Iraq uh, and in Turkey wanted to uh, consolidate power in Iran. And then the Mongol invasion came, Genghis Khan, um, which influenced and set the destiny of so many different people. My last name is Khan, and uh, there's about 300 million of us, 200 million of us. There's, there's many, many, many. Uh, and the Mongol invasions created. The Mongols eventually accepted Islam that turned into the Mughali Empire, which has its own history. And a little bit more, we'll talk about one of the ethnic minorities in Afghanistan who were uh, directly related to the Mongol invasions. And in the 18th century, Durrani, who is also known as Ahmed Shah Abdali, uh, defeated the Mughals and the Persians, and he consolidated the Afghan empire. And that's where we have sort of the modern state of Afghanistan as we know it today. And then there was conflict with the British. There's not many people on this earth who haven't been in conflict with the British. Um, and Afghanistan was no exception. As we know, that the British Empire had conquered or had set up an established reign over India and wanted to create a buffer between the Russian Empire um, and its own Raj in India. And so it led to two different wars uh, in Afghanistan. In the last, the second Anglo British War, the Anglo Afghan War, uh, left Afghanistan as a British protectorate. There were many different incidents that happened after that, but Afghanistan eventually gained full independence as a sovereign state in 1919 as the Kingdom of Afghanistan. It was ruled as a monarchy, ruled by Muhammad Zahir Shah, um, who was the son of uh, the founding uh, royal who established Afghanistan in the rule for 40 different years. There was a communist uprising and in the 70s which led eventually to the Soviet invasion, and which set off the Soviet-Afghan war. And as many different parts of the war were influenced by the Cold War uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union, the USSR at that time, Afghanistan was also caught up in the middle. So this invasion and this occupying of Afghanistan led to between the lowest estimates of death were about 500,000, Afghanis, all the way up to 2 million Afghans, and displaced 6 million others as refugees, primarily to Pakistan. I'll show you a picture later on that I'm sure every single person in this Zoom call today has seen, which is an offshoot, which is a resultant of what happened post the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. But this, the, the Soviet invasion set up everything that was to happen and everything that has been happening up until the recent events that we've seen this year that are leading to the latest refugees who are coming to the United States. And it destabilized a country. A little bit later on, I will show you the different ethnicities that reside within Afghanistan and the, and the, 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 uh, the tribal connections that the people of Afghanistan, many of the people of Afghanistan have, is strong. And what happened as a result of the Soviet invasion is it disrupted many things. And then once the Soviet left, there was a vacuum, of course. And the vacuum was filled, um, in this case, by the Taliban. Now, the Taliban, many of its leaders, many of the people um, who would go on to consolidate power in the early 90s and the mid-90s, in the late 90s, they were trained by the CIA, and they were the Mujahideen, the holy warriors uh, who were trained to fight the Soviet Union. And after the Soviet Union left and in this vacuum, we had the Taliban who saw an opportunity to change society because we know that throughout history, when there are momentous moments in history and there are wars and there are 
societies that change, there's a vacuum and then someone else has this opportunity to come and take power and the Taliban did. Well, many people know who they think, the image that comes into their mind when they think of Afghanistan is what we see now that was under Taliban rule or uh, current Taliban rule. And honestly, this is not the Afghanistan that has existed for so many years. And, um, and I'll show you a little bit uh, about that. And I'm sure many people have seen the pictures of Afghanistan 40, 50 years ago and its cosmopolitan nature. But this is the reality of the situation. We could discuss this for a long time, but we have to move on. And the U.S. invasion in 2001 uh, and the war that lasted from 2001 to 2021, which 20 years invested hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars invested and then uh, the United States leaves as a force and the Taliban um, are now in power again and not much was accomplished in these 20 years except for more destabilization of the country and this leads us to the current situation that we're in and I'm sure many of you seen on TV and in the news and through the newsreels um, social media about the mad scramble of the people who had aided the United States Army as either translators or cooks or line workers um, in many uh, common ways who are now under the direct threat of the Taliban for aiding the United States. And many of them were given special visas to leave and they left with the United States. Many of them were not. And they were left behind in Afghanistan. And many of them, we do not know what has happened to them. A, we have a pretty good idea what may have happened to them. But this is the resultant of messy foreign affairs and policy that uh, can never be cleanly left. And so this is another example of that. Obviously, we could talk about this for a long time, but uh, we're going to move on with the rest of the presentation. So the post-Soviet uh, invasion in 1979 and the post-factional civil conflict that happened before the rise of the Taliban and the conflict of the United States brought most of the first wave of uh, Afghan refugees. Those of you who've read Kite Runner, that first wave um, that came post the Soviet Union, um, there's a very poignant scene in the Kite Runner where people are escaping at night um, in the backs of trucks making their way to Pakistan. This was actually what happened in reality. We have families here who went through the same thing as little children, and then they made it now to uh, the United States, settled in many different areas. The largest areas of settlement are in Fremont, California, where you have communities, large communities where many of the Afghans came and they settled in farm work in Fremont and around the San Joaquin Valley. And large centers, you'll see entire masjids which is the Arabic word for mosque. Um, a mosque is a French appellation of the, of the word masjid. And uh, we also see them in Flushing, Queens. We have a family that's here when, that uh, were resettled in Flushing. And they came here to Oregon. And Northern Virginia also has a large population. There's about 156,000 in the United States as of 2019, approximately. And we have a few thousand here in, in Oregon. The Afghan economy, from where many of the, uh, the people who are going to come, not only on the special visas, but who came post the Soviet invasion, they come from primarily an agrarian economy. One of the great things that we've seen recently, and this is one of the good aspects, and most of it has been through expat re- um, uh, putting into the economy and uh, contributing to it. We see the GDP per capita grow from about 900 to 2,000, uh, mostly inflation adjusted. So that has been one positive that's there. Afghanistan is an exporter of wheat, barley, maize, grapes, watermelon, apples, um, large livestock and poultry farming. And they have deposits of coal, copper, gold, iron ore, some natural gas and petroleum that have been untapped that uh, hopefully can be developed better. And it is the largest exporter of lapis lazuli, those who are Minecraft aficionados or have seen the beautiful 
dark blue jewelry that uh, have been some of the traditional uh, artwork and jewelry of Afghanistan. So Islam is the official religion of Afghanistan. The government is an Islamic republic even before the Taliban. And the Islamic values, the mores, the ethos, uh, the concept and practices and form many of the social and behavioral norms throughout society. And 99.7% approximately of Afghans are Muslim. There are some very small residual communities there of other faiths, including mostly Christians, some Sikhs, some Hindus, and a Baha'i. Uh, and again, going back to Latricia and Brianna's point about the impossibility of monolith, monolithic explanations of things, regardless of how observant an Afghan Muslim is, uh, there is only some sort of engagement with Islam because it's imbued within the culture. You grow up in a place where you have the call to prayer that's next to you. You have um, a, a society that was governed the everyday uh, flow of life around prayers and around holidays and the communal day of gathering, which I'll mention in just a second. So whether a person is observant or not, that worldview that they have or the Welt and Schaum that people mention, it is informed and it is cultivated and it is formed and shaped by this Islamic ethos. So that's one thing that's that's definitely there. About 90% of the population is Sunni and about 10% of the population is Shia. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. The most populous, uh, the Pashtuns, Tajiks, and Uzbeks, and I'll talk about the ethnicities, which is a very important aspect uh, about Afghanistan in just a second, are Sunni, where the Hazara comprise the vast majority of the Shi'i population. Some of the holidays and observances, fasting in the month of Ramadan. This upcoming year in 2022, uh, the Islamic calendar is in the lunar calendar, so Ramadan arrives about 10 days earlier each year. So this year will be from about April, the beginning of April to the, the end of April, the beginning of May. The communal day of prayer is on Friday. So in much of the world, the Islamic world, the, the, the weekend will be Thursday and Friday or Friday and Saturday. And this is something that, that many of people in Afghanistan are also accustomed to. The major holidays are Eid al-Fitr, which is the feast of the breaking of the fast at the end of Ramadan. Eid al-Adha, which is the feast of sacrifice, which happens during the month of Hajj, when the people make the pilgrimage, one of the five pillars of Islam. And one of the other ones is the Malad, which is the Prophet's birthday, which just happened a few weeks back. And some, one of some of the central guiding points of the prohibition of eating pork and drinking alcohol. In a little bit, I'll talk some more about uh, some of the values inherent in Afghan culture as they've been shaped a lot by the Islamic ethos. And one of the things that we always try to mention in our presentations about Islam is that when, when presenting and talking about one's own values and faith uh, and things that are important, we often say about the things that are important to us, not about the things that, that are prohibited. So, but these are things that are often brought up and I wanted to mention this in this presentation. Um, but uh, was one of the things I wanted to mention there. Okay. Now, some of the ethnicities and languages spoken, I cannot stress how important it is in the, Af the Afghan mindset that the ethnicity in which you come from determines a lot of how you see yourself in Afghan society. And that it is not as simple as, well, you know, Maybe that was the case in Afghanistan, where, where uh, ethnic tribal lines were very important, but they're not anymore. But you'll see people who this is of utmost importance to them, whether they're in Afghanistan, or that they have come here, or to Canada, or Australia, um, or whatever the places that they have been resettled. So it is of, of, of great importance. And also important to realize is that this idea of this nationhood, this nationalist, nationalistic nationhood of Afghanistan, is a nascent idea in the grand scheme of things, as we saw in the history in the 18th century. And it's much the same, oftentimes we try to make uh, analogous about Italy. So you had Italy that came together as a nationhood in the 1800s, but 
but prior to that, before seeing oneself as Italian, one saw oneself as Sicilian or Milano or um, you know Calabrian or whatever the case may be. And often that's the case too in Afghanistan. As I can, you can see here, there's not one ethnicity that's the major, uh, uh, the, the majority ethnic group of more than 50%. Pashtuns make up 42%, which is the largest group. And then you'll see of the Tajik, the Hazara, um, and the Uzbek. So the Pashtuns make up along the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. So in Pakistan, we also have people who are Pashtun. Uh, for example, Malala, uh, the, the young, courageous woman who won the Nobel Prize, her family is Pashtun, uh, even though they're in Pakistan, because they grew up here along the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. And so Pashtuns are 42% uh, the largest, and then you have the Tajiks, and the Hazra, and the Uzbek. If you look at the Hazra, they're in the central area of Afghanistan, and they also comprise the majority of the Shia Muslims in Afghanistan as well. The Hazra are um, related directly to Mongolians, and Mongolians, when the invasion came, uh, the, the Hazra traced their lineage back to them. And so the Hazra are sometimes set apart from other Afghans because they're visually uh, different in the way that they look, um, apart from other members of Afghanistan. But, you know, when someone says, well, what does an Afghan person look like? I'm going to show you in just a second. The diversity is vast and wide, and you can't say, well, you know, this is what an Afghan looks like, because Afghans look like everything, um, which I'll show you in just a second. So the language is spoken. Um, Pashtuns, they speak Pashto, and the... Others, mostly those, you can see the, the, the other languages. Most of the non pashtuns they speak Dari. And so Dari is a classical version of, uh, of Persian and Farsi. And if you look at the western border of Afghanistan, the western border of Afghanistan, in the, in the other slide that we have, it abuts the Iranian border. And so the ruling family of the Persian Empire at that time was right there. And so Dari um, came into existence and used here in Afghanistan. And so there are various versions of it. Many of the people who speak Dari, they can also speak Pashto, and bilingualism is, is very common. The two official languages are Dari and Pashto. And so when you see the people who are coming, they will be speaking either Pashto uh, or uh, Dari, uh, or both. Oftentimes the people who speak Dari, they can also speak Pashto. It's less likely that the people who speak Pashto will also be speaking Dari. Um, many, the Dari Persian is spoken by 78% of the Afghans. Pashto is spoken by 50%. Uzbek, 10%. English now has been growing as uh, a language in Afghanistan. Turkmen, 2%, Urdu, which is spoken by uh, people in Pakistan. Many of us, the refugees who went to Pakistan and then came back in Afghanistan, they spoke, they, they spoke uh, and they speak Urdu. And so this was a growing language there. And on top of that, Urdu and Hindi are about 90% lexically similar. And so the, the vocabulary is much the same. So you see Bollywood films in Hindi uh, much of the vocabulary is the same as Urdu, and so because of these films are popular, you have people learning how to speak uh, Urdu in Hindi as well. So the ethnic diversity of Afghanistan is extremely wide, because you have this confluence of cultures, and you have a confluence of cultures from both the north and the east and the west and the south, and so you will have people who will have darker skin tones, and then you have people who have lighter skin tones. You have people who have dark eyes, you have people who have light eyes, um, and, and everything in between. And so when people think of well, what does an Afghan look like or what does a Muslim look like, it's hard to say that because the, the diversity is so wide. Uh, 
and I'm sure many of you have seen, I'm, I'm sure all of you have seen the picture on the bottom left right here of the young woman who was a refugee in Pakistan post the Soviet invasion. And this picture captured the minds and hearts of many people when they first found out about the Afghan refugee crisis that has been going on since then. Um, and the haunting look that's in her eyes. But one of the other things that people did see, and I think was new for many people, is that you had people in Afghan with light colored eyes, and many people didn't know that. So the ethnic diversity and, and is wide and diverse, and we can't ever say, well, you know, this is what an Afghan person looks like. On the bottom right there, you have Kabul in the 60s, and many people are surprised to see that you have people uh, looking and dressing a lot different than the images that people see now. So this is uh, something else I did want to see. And if you look up and you Google Kabul, Afghanistan, in the 1960s, you'll see a cosmopolitan city. Some of the core concepts of Afghan culture. And these are related. You can see comments about this and references to this throughout history. Two of them are resilience and stoicism. Now stoicism is that when someone is, is, has gone through as much as these people have, the people of Afghanistan have, one learns to be stoic because the everyday, uh, you know, quotidian things that, that bother us, you know, the ephemera and, uh, you know, fleeting things, they don't seem as big when you've had a war that's been fought or when you've seen tens of thousands of people die, you've seen family members die, you've seen great uh, deprivation and privation that it it's, doesn't seem as great. So you have this resilient, strong culture of independence, which is why so many people that have come into Afghanistan have left without being able to subdue the population. And it's been uh, a central part uh, of the culture. Loyalty and honor and compassion and hospitality are also very uh, strong factors, and I'll mention a little bit about that in a second. Some of the family and household structure. Afghan culture tends to be very collectivistic. And people are, uh, they put their family's interests before their own. So there is this idea about my family unit. And you see this when the people settled in Fremont or in Queens. Um, many different people gathering together in these multi-generational families because that's the way that they lived. And an idea of independence, a person's own independence, is not uh, central to the Afghan mindset. Now, obviously, that's in general. Uh, specific people can have that. But it's very different from an independent pioneer spirit of going out into the vast unknown, which has formed, of course, a core aspect of American exceptionalism um, and philosophy. But so Afghans tend to be very collectivist. And they're loyal to one's family. And that loyalty often supersedes uh, the obligations also to one's tribe or ethnicity, but there's a very strong I I identity linked to the language that you speak in, and the ethnicity. When you ask the Afghans that come, they'll say, yes, I'm Afghan, but I'm also Pashtun, or I'm Tajik, or I'm Uzbek, or I'm Hazara, or, or, or I'm uh, Turkmen, or I'm Balochi. And, and this is uh, also very strong. Family matters are kept very private. And people are often very, and, and we'll come back to this in the second and third uh, workshops that talk about government services. People are very reluctant to share personal issues with non-family members as that community knowledge of a family struggle in whatever way can bring shame upon the household. And sometimes, now that we see it, you have many of these groups of people, though it's not defined there maybe, that they've suffered from PTSD from the things that they've seen. And sometimes discussing even mental health is something that's a taboo topic. Afghan households are generally large and multi-generational. In 2010, the average size of an Afghan household was about eight people. 
And traditionally, this is made up of a husband and a wife, um, daughters who are not married yet, and then their sons and son spouses and children. So, you know, one of the things that when people discuss about China and it's one child policy, which has now been amended a little bit, and, and why this is, when you grow up in large uh, agrarian societies and agricultural societies, the sons are the ones that stay and then their sons create to the success of the farm. The daughters, they will marry and go off into another family. This is why oftentimes you've had this long generational um, uh, quality of running sons. And this is the reason for it. And uh, this is sometimes imbued in, in, in culture. So you know, in extended in family households, two or four generations may live, you'll see this here. As well, we know families here that have come here, they have multiple generations. And this may be in walled compounds there. You'll see multiple family units put together here in the United States. Um, and you know, you might have a couple that have their own room, but it might be the part of the domicile. And this is something that's common here as well. Some of the common customs and etiquettes. Uh, agreeing with Salaam Alaikum peace be upon you, is universal. And one of the other things that uh, I would like to mention as well is that sometimes we have in this vernacular that I mentioned about um, uh, about mosque and masjid. We use the term masjid, which is the term that Muslims use. The same can be said about the word Muslim itself. Sometimes we heard the, hear the, the term is pronounced Muslim, and the Muslim is a French, again, a Franco appellation to the language. But in uh, the word Muslim comes from Arabic and it's pronounced Muslim. And when addressing somebody who is a Muslim, saying Muslim all of a sudden puts you into a different category of someone who's understanding. Uh, one should not touch people of the opposite gender unless they are very close family or friends. Afghans take great, great pride in their hospitality and it's considered an honor um, to host guests. I mean, so when you may find that Afghans seek to host you quite early on you know, in a relationship, in a friendship with them, and they will go pull out all the stops for you. Guests to Afghan homes, uh, like other Muslim homes, should remove their shoes at the door. Men and women are often seated and in, in, uh, separated in most social visits. You'll have socializing of men in one room and women of another room. Afghans are not Arabs, nor are they Middle Eastern. And the term Middle Eastern itself is a colonial term. And because it was Middle Eastern, Europe is the center. The Far East is, is China. Everything in between is the Middle East from the perspective of Europe. So um, this terminology, uh, Afghans are not Arabs. And they don't identify as such. Afghanistan is a South Central Asian country. And as we mentioned, it's composed of many different ethnicities. The term Afghani refers to the currency of money in Afghanistan. And it is not an adjective that's used like, you know, Afghani hospitality. Afghan is the adjective. So Afghan food, Afghan customs, Afghan um, whatever we're going to attach to it. So we modify with Afghan and not Afghani. Some of the Afghan cuisine that you may see um, here, there's not as many Afghan restaurants, Afghan restaurants that's uh, here, but in other places in California and Northern Virginia, we see them. One of the special dishes called kabli palau. And this is an extraordinarily delicious dish, and it's often made on special occasions. If you have not tried it, it will change your world. It is so delicious. And then we have a version of naan bread as well, mantu, which are dumplings, and then kebab. So the, the, the things that are grown, um, uh, as we mentioned about the kind of about wheat and barley and raisins, uh, these are the, the fruits and vegetables that are used in the cooking. Mostly it's rice dishes with meat um, and stews. It's really hearty fare made for rigorous um, work life and dancing calories. 
Afghans have a long history of the arts, including clay pottery, and that dates back thousands of years. We found those artifacts and some of the beautiful lapis lazuli, the blue jewelry that's made, and then, of course, handmade Afghan rugs um, that uh, are extraordinarily beautiful. And poetry has been an influential art form in Afghanistan for many years. The poet Rumi, that many have read and have enjoyed, he was born in Bok, which is in Afghanistan, and he spoke Farsi, and he wrote in Farsi along with uh, other languages as well. And it's very interesting because what people's idea of Afghanistan is now, based on what's in the modern uh, context here and, and, and what we see, Rumi was known far ahead of his time, and his ideas of uh, not only legal scholarship, but mysticism and finding the beauty internally. He was, he was forged by values of a society, this Persian society they lived in in Afghanistan and Islam, and some of the most beautiful poetry that he wrote that really touches upon uh, the human condition were, uh, were formed and shaped by these thoughts. I'm going to read a quick poem here. A moment of happiness, you and I sitting on the veranda, apparently two, but one and so, you and I. We feel the flowing water of life here, you and I, with the garden's beauty. And the birds singing, the stars will be watching us, and we will show them what it is to be a thin crescent moon. You and I, unsuffed, will be together. You can see a lot of the collectivist ideas about life um, inherent and imbued in Rumi's poetry. Afghan music uh, is the, the rubab, which is a stringed instrument that you see here in the first two images. It's a beautiful, strong, um, beautifully melancholic sound that comes from it. It's really hard to describe. I, I don't think we have enough time here um, to play it, but I'm going to leave this link here. Please enjoy some of this. It's, it's, it's very interesting, the sound. You also see from sitar in the tabla, very popular in Afghan music. I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the work of the Muslim Educational Trust, as uh, uh, Latricia had alluded to a little bit earlier. For the past 28 years, the Muslim Educational Trust has been seeking to address the social determinants of health. And, and we know that when people think about health, oftentimes we think about the end when we're getting medical care or people are in the hospital. But we want to address everything that goes in before that we need to see seek health care itself, besides the, the monthly checkups or, or the yearly checkups that we have and, and the constant awareness of our health. And we know many different things go into the social determinants of health, including employment, and learning the skills, the job skills. Many of the people who are going to be coming from Afghanistan, they have skills that they have learned because they work with the US State Department and the United States military forces. So many of them speak English, they have skills, um, but there's others who don't and uh, they do not have those skills. And many were farmers as many of the first people who came the Afghan wave post the Soviet invasion. So we know that we, one of the things that we're doing is having people be available um, to receive this job training. And it's something that we've done with our community as well. And the other thing is about food and nutrition. And we have provided last, for, for the past 28 years, on an ad hoc basis, we have ran the Halal Food Pantry and uh, providing culturally sensitive food for people who seek it. We keep this in the high gear post the COVID pandemic, uh, the first month or so that people, we went into quarantine, March of 2020, we realized that there were so many people in the Muslim community that work in the service industry and that the service industry was shut down. The hotels were shut down, people stopped using Ubers, um, uh, taxis, and so we knew that uh, people would have to be served. So we created our emergency food box program we distributed about, uh, I don't know how many boxes of food now, it's nearing 10,000, uh, to all parts of the city, to Washington County and uh, to other parts of, uh, of the Portland metropolitan area and Oregon as, as well. And we know that having this food security leads to greater health. 
and greater health leads to more stabilized communities. And when you have a stabilized community, you have people who want to, f and, and they feel that they are vested in this society, that they're part of this society. That, and of course, the work of other agencies who make people, whether they're immigrants or refugees or others, feel like they are part of this society, that we are value added. Uh, many of the people who came as refugees, within one generation, they had become entrepreneurs. Uh, many in the same generation itself, you'll see restaurants open, um, high tech uh, that, that has been established, companies that have been established, consulting, and many others. But we felt that providing this food would, would be one um, of those parts of the determinants of health. Rental support, we have about 40 families that we've assisted have come in about the last 150 days and they live here around uh, us at the Muslim Educational Trust. We're about a half a mile away from, from Washington Square um, Mall and uh, here in Washington County, we've been able to provide for some of these families. Obviously, the need is going to be much greater and we do know that there's going to be other additional funds that will be able to help them. But one of the things that we've allowed in one of the social determinants of health is about neighborhood and physical environment. We've allowed them to be close to our center here in a place which is a communal gathering place, especially on Fridays, um, especially as we've seen some of the COVID restrictions lifted um, and uh, uh, larger gathering space, especially for people who are of an older generation who love to speak their language with others, who love to speak in Pashto or Dali or Arabic or Somali or whatever it is um, with other people. And that communal space was lost during the pandemic and it, it, it took a toll on many people. This was sometimes the only outlet that people had on a Friday to engage with others of their community. So we're really thankful that we can provide this space as well. And also counseling services, um, that sometimes counseling services in the refugee and immigrant community is a taboo topic because physical strife and physical ailments are often taken priority because we see them, obviously, those things, the challenges of the mind that everybody has are invisible. Um, so we have culturally responsive counseling services for families, um, both the refugees and immigrants that have come, but also existing family units that have faced many multi-generational challenges as the values of a place where somebody came from sometimes come in clash with new values that are alone and there's amalgam that is of their children um, and, and their own values that they have. And then some of the things, I'm going to cut this short because I know I'm short on time uh, and I want to leave the last eight minutes for the question and answers. It should be 10 minutes and I apologize for that. But here are some of the other things that the Muslim Education does amongst many other programs, including running a full-time pre-K to 12th Islamic school is the only accredited full-time Islamic school in the Pacific Northwest, including running many different workshops. Um, I left a link, I'll leave this link in the chat here about our annual report and some of the things that we do, which of course we can play in one of our other uh, uh, workshops as well. So I know that was the world one and I want to stop right there. And I am back for the seven minutes. I apologize, Bianca and Latricia, I went over the time. Um, and But I'm here for the question and answer. So thank you. Thank you so much, brother, for the information. And I do want to jump right in with our limited time. I'm going to, I hear a little bit of an echo and I apologize. I'm going to add the ground rules into the chat just to remind people of what they are so we can move forward into our questioning. And the first question that I have for you is from Martin that asked, what's the relationship under today's Taliban rule between the Sunni and the, the Shia populations? So unfortunately, the, the now relationship, and, and it was before as well, um, was a very negative relationship between the Taliban and um, certain groups within Afghanistan. One of the things that I want to make clear um, in Islam is that theologically there is not a difference, uh, that great of a difference between Shia and Sunni. It's mostly a matter of historical leadership post um, the death of the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, 
and so it's 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 that's a whole history in itself but islam itself is that everybody within that faith is within that faith but for political reasons and much that we've seen of other demagoguery throughout history when you have someone who's a scapegoat that you can ally yourself against it allows for people to uh, gather resilience and, and gain other people under that so that is it's unfortunate that that's what's happening in that negative relationship right now but i do want to make clear that this is something that the great majority of people don't see as representative of Islam. Thank you. And that seems to be the only outstanding question. Um, but I will kind of rephrase one that we did answer a little bit earlier about resources. So for those of us who have a desire to do some kind of learning on our own in between these sessions, um, where might we go to get some more information that we could study with? Okay, um, we are putting together a list of uh, resources and books and links to learn more about the current situation and a little bit about the history if people want, and then we're going to be passing that along. But as of right now, if somebody is interested, I'm going to put in the chat here our email that goes to many of us over here that if someone's interested in volunteer opportunities, um, like for example, uh, the other day, we had uh, multiple food boxes that we were putting together for some of the Afghan families. If people want to volunteer in any other way or provide support, please send an email to admin at uh, metpdx.org. If you would like to talk to somebody, it could be me, but you probably heard enough of me, so it might be somebody else. I have a phone number here as well, and reach out to us. And we have many different ways that we can... Um, reach out, and especially to Afghan uh, community leadership as well. And we are a gathering organization that knows and understands about the resettling process and what goes on to create healthy communities. But we also have Afghan leaders themselves who can speak directly um, about some of the challenges as well, too. So, and then how you, and how people can help. Perfect. Thank you. And I do have a few more questions for yes. you if we could. Is there a, a larger percentage of religious minorities among the refugees coming to the U.S.? No, I would say that the, the refugees who are coming to the United States are pretty uh, representative of the ethnic breakdown and of the religious breakdown in the first few slides. 90, 20, 90, 10, although that 90, you know, might be 85, it's it's hard because there's no hard census. In the United States, not everyone's filling out the census, so we can imagine in maybe tribal areas. So it's about 85 to 90, um, uh, and about 15 to 10 Sunni Shia split, and then the ethnic split about 42 Pashtun, 27 Tajik, and then about 10, 10, is basically what the refugee population itself is going to be. It's going to be very close to that. Okay, thank you. Um, curiosity, um, how do Afghan people answer questions in the census or when demogra demographic data is requested and options for answers are like white, black, Asian, Pacific Islander, you know, Latino, um, you know, Native American or other? So this is a very interesting question and something that we have thought about because currently, um, as, as, as late as the last U.S. Census, um, Afghan Americans and also people from the Arab speaking world, like from the Levant, uh, the Gulf area, have long, and North Africa actually too, have been considered white Americans um, and under the category white, which is uh, strange, I think, in many ways. Uh, and we're hoping that's going to be changed for the next U.S. Census. People can also um, classify themselves as Asian, which they are, um, but there's a certain connotation with Asian that, that specifically denotes East Asian or South Asian. So sometimes the Afghan community has, has been reticent for that as well. But uh, currently the most accurate one would be Asian, um, as they are on the continent of, of Asia. But in the past, uh, they have been classified under white Americans, along with many from the Arab speaking world. Interesting. Thank you. Um, next. Um, so with the shortage in uh, Washington County and all of like the homeless Ness, um, that we're experiencing in our, you know, in our area, where are um, our new, you know, Afghan brothers and sisters going to live? Where are they, you know, planning to planning to settle? 
Right. This is a you know this is a question that we've thought about as well. As I mentioned in the presentation, we have uh, some of the families that we've been in contact with about forty of them. Um, we have been able to provide rental support uh, through the grants that we have to the city of Beaverton and um, CDBG. So that's that's in one one area that we've been able to do it. And so uh, that obviously is not going to be enough for the the all the people who come in. So what we're going to do is that we're going to um, make. Uh, uh, so what we're going to do is that now we're looking into the different sources that are going to come in. So just uh, this weekend, we had the Biden administration talk about how it was going to partner with uh, private foundations and with cities to provide this funding that's been put into the budget. Um, for uh, Afghan resettling. So we know that they are on, on bases right now and they will have to find places. And this money that's going to be allocated will have to be used for finding housing. Now, obviously it's a tricky uh, situation because you already have housing issue problems with the existing population and how that's going to, to work out. And that's what we hope that our friends also at Washington County, um, of course, in the state of Oregon is going to help us figure out what's going to be the best spot. Sometimes you have uh, refugees who wind up housing with people in the community um, that could be extended family. Sometimes we have that. Sometimes we have other organizations, resettling organizations that are helping um, Lutheran Family Services and, and uh, Catholic Charities to be, you know, to name some. So we're hoping that this money that's going to be part of the budget for resettling, and it's not uh, an inconsequential amount, is going to be used to solve some of this. And then, of course, all the other complications that we have. This is um, something at the county level and the state level that everyone's going to have to figure out for the best possible outcomes, obviously, for everybody. Thank you. Um, what recommendations do you have for accessing interpretation or translation services in the various languages spoken by the uh, refugees who are coming to Oregon? Well, for anyone who does need those translation services, uh, MET can, can serve as a, a hub for that. And um, the, the email that we, I put in the chat for at admin at metpdx.org, they can reach us and then we can get people into contact with um, the right interpreters. We also have um, uh, different Afghan groups who are getting together who are part of uh, preparing for this and making themselves accessible as interpreters in the future. So uh, we can serve as a locus point and if somebody does need that. And in the next two workshops that we have that are specifically going to be about governmental services, we can speak a little bit more about that as well, um, about how to get in contact with that. But as of right now, if somebody does need it, they can contact us and then we can find somebody who's going to be able to translate both in, in Pashto or in Dari um, or in Uzbek or Tajik um, or maybe some of the other languages that are less spoken, but we can also find for that. But for those, for sure, we can do that. Thank you. And to that point, there was a question that also came in about other support centers beyond MET, so as to not overburden you. Are you all like the only group um, that, that will be supporting this population or are there other resources to be able to, um, to, to help, um, to help the, the group coming over to you? Right. Uh, currently, right now, that we know um, who can understand uh, uh, the, the multiple complexities, we're serving as their hub. But we also refer out to other organizations, as I mentioned, with Lutheran Family Services and Catholic Charities of Oregon in terms of specific needs. Um, but as a holistic uh, uh, first stop, we're serving as that to um, allow for the different issues that, that they may have and the things that they may need, the people they may need to talk to, but um, some of those organizations. And again, in the next two workshops, I think that are more specifically about service oriented, we're going to be able to distill all that information out as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, now, as we continue talking about like, you know, culture, and that's really history and culture is kind of where we started. There was a question that came in um, that is a little complex to me, but you, it might be easier for you, so I just want to try to get this right. Um, are there certain 
dispensations that have been made to allow for meals to be consumed consumed with utensils rather than from with one's right hand um like i i it says i know they give visitors their own bowl um in covid 19 times this could be problematic and one of the programs that is offered through um HHS or Health and Human Services um, would be to offer education um, support about food waste preve prevention. And so, um, but we also, we also want to be mindful about thinking about how food is enjoyed in the home and make appropriate recommendations. So um, I know that was a pretty loaded question, but just kind of curious about, um, you know, the, the cultural aspect of, of consuming food versus, um, I guess, like the more Western way, but wanting to be able to do what's right to support um, the Afghan um, people. Right. And, you know, uh, uh, thank you for this question, but it is, as I mentioned before in the presentation, there's no one monolith about how people are. So you have people who are from the city and um, very comfortable using utensils, as are people from um, from wherever. There are certain preferences of eating with the hand that uh, people have grown up with. And in COVID times, these are certain considerations that we have, and they've been addressed on the basis, um, uh, specifically addressed on the basis. And then people understand that, and you know they understand that um, in certain cases that we need that. And, and even in the Islamic faith, we have this, uh, when you have certain uh, considerations, we take those considerations. And I don't think it's been a big problem for people um, in their own homes when, when, when they're there and they um, get to choose the wish the way they want. I don't think it's a problem there. Um, but uh, as far as adjusting on bases or other places, I think that's been a pretty uh, seamless transition. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you so much. I'm sure that'll be very helpful to yeah. um, the, the person working in that area that talks about those particular things. So thank you. Um, I'm looking at two final questions and these two mm -hmm. questions are, are pretty much the same. I see like the same kind of language in both. So <laughs> I, I might just kind of do just one. Um, but if as an American who is not Muslim, um, if I greet or try to greet an Afghan person with the greeting um, that you mentioned, you know, right. peace be unto you or peace be with you in an attempt to connect or to show the desire to connect. Um, is that rude or inappropriate or condescending or is that a good thing or like what, what, and I, of course we know that, that you are of course your own person. So your thought might not be the next person's thought, but just really curious um, about your thoughts around um, uh, an American person who's not Muslim trying to greet someone with peace be with you or peace be unto you. Right. And, you know, I think in most cases when we have, and, and, and I'm glad about the delineation and the distinction about uh, as a group and speaking for a group and an individual aspect, I think when in, in, in cases such as this, the demeanor of the person when they come and they speak, if you can feel it, and you know a person who's going to approach and um, they're absolutely well-meaning, this will be taken very well, and this will be taken as a, a, a mark that someone is trying to understand and accept and that they know. Sometimes you'll have people who might expect that uh, people have no understanding of any part of, of, of them. And then having somebody come and say, Assalamu Alaikum or peace be unto you, um, you know, they're smiling and they're open and, you know, they're visually accepting. Um, I think this will make a big difference for people. And, and I don't think it would be considered rude or taken impolitely. I mean, that's my, has been my experience uh, and, and working in, uh, you know, a CBO for, 20 plus years, uh, that's generally been been the experience. So I think if someone does that and uh, comes out open and has that uh, inviting personality uh, and look to them uh, and says it, I think it'll be taken really well. Mm, okay. And so would that be, and I, I'm, I'm kind of looking at the second question that's very similar, but it's uh, kind of the same thing, but also asking, you know, can I say it? You know, and can I say assalamu alaikum or should I, you know, or should I, you know, just say, you know, peace be unto you? You know, we can say both. And, and you know, even it can be even start up with like a hello, you know, you know my name is X and, um, you know, assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, you know, welcome. Um, and uh, I think that'd be an amazing experience that uh, that right away let somebody know. You know, a, a small corollary uh, uh, to this is that I remember when I was young, 
and in school. And um, oftentimes I, I, I was in school in places that maybe I was the only Muslim student that was there here growing up in the United States and Texas, California, Illinois, Colorado, and other places. And, you know, a teacher one time did this and um, it was in Illinois and I was in third grade, uh, second grade. And she came up to me and she said, you know, hi, you know, uh, I, I know from your family, you are Muslim. So, you know, I want to greet you with a salam alaikum. And I thought it was, and of course I was a kid, but no one else had ever done that before. And uh, it made that whole experience different. I knew that she wanted me to feel as part of that classroom that was there. And it wasn't really, um, uh, and I, remember, I still remember that now. You know, I, I don't think I remember anything else from second grade in Illinois, uh, but I do remember that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think someone else doing this and this welcoming and it's the demeanor that it comes from. And I think it really be accepted. Thank you so much. That just makes me so warm inside, you know, as our goal is really to, to do the best that we can as, you know, as a, the Washington County community to be able to welcome people. And I think that that was a wonderful question or a wonderful story to be able to end on. Those are all of the questions um, that I have um, at this time. And so I just want to, you know, remind everyone that we have a few more sessions that we're going to have the opportunity to go through. I know that um, you, um, Professor Khan um, will be with us again, but also I think your colleague as well um, will be joining us the next time we get together. So I'll just tell everyone in Washington County to look out for additional information. Um, everyone should have received um, the calendar invites. Um, if you have not received the calendar invites and want more information about um, these learning opportunities, you're welcome to um, connect with me, Brianna Jackson, or um, Latricia Tillman in the Office of Equity, Inclusion, and community engagement. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Khan, for your time today. Thank you so much, Brianna. Thank you, Washington County. It was a pleasure and we hope to see you again soon. Looking forward to it. All right. Take care.